we got a special dig deeper today um, in which we're inviting you guys inside a burial excavation area. Um, I'm standing inside one of our burial recovery structures and I'm down on the floor below the ground surface of the 167 burial ground. Now the focus of today's dig deeper is the excavation of this area the lengths that we go to do that and the results that we get uh, from the excavation of human remains. So this burial ground that I'm standing actually below the surface of the ground here is three of the known burials of the 30-something that are out here on top of the hill. These represent the colonists who died in the fall and winter of 167 and 8. And none of the individuals that we found so far inside the, the fort on the hill here are in coffins. They're wrapped in shrouds, some of them. Some of them uh, no shrouds and sort of put in the holes. But this, this burial ground we found in 2007 with our Summer Field Institute through the University of Virginia. And at the time, we preserved the site. So a lot of visitors come out and they look curiously at us down so deep and wonder why we're, you know, why it is the ground, you know, it's so deep in the ground, the features. And it's because we backfill and preserve the site. Not everything at Jamestown has been excavated. There's a lot left to do. In fact, probably 90 some percent of everything we find is still out here. Um, and what we do is we dig down till we can identify features or activity, human activity, pits, cellars, graves, ditches, things like that. And then we backfill and you can see here behind me, at the bottom is geotextile fabric. So once we map, photograph, do what we need to do to discover or rediscover the features, we then backfill and preserve it so that we can come back on our schedule when it's appropriate and when we can dedicate the resources and time and excavate. So we know from our previous excavations, which was span over a decade now in this area, that all of these individuals are the representative of the 104 men and boys that arrived and set up a fort here in the spring or in May of 167. Staff and the support that's here, and I want the public to understand this, is not just the rediscovery team. We now have an international team of researchers supporting and are being our colleagues of the, the project and currently our forensic anthropologist is Dr. Ashley McCowan, who's in Texas, and uh, Dr. Raquel Fleskes, who does ancient DNA, who's in Connecticut at the University of Connecticut. And so when we're excavating, that's on a schedule. And so that schedule has to be very tight as, as researchers are flying in to work with us um, as we go through that forensic process of recovery. Now the building I'm in that we build is for a couple reasons. Um, there's a light mist and rain today, and that's certainly one of the reasons, right? We consider ourselves dirt surgeons when we're involved in the data recovery of human remains, and you cannot have human remains that hasn't seen the light of day in 400 years be exposed to the elements. So first and foremost, that's, that's why we construct the tent. We've also had issues in the past with animals. So squirrels have come in and mice and things like that. So that's another reason. We also need to lower the possibility of contamination down when we're excavating. And so I, you know, I chuckle about that because a lot of visitors uh, and even some reporters and things like that want to refer to this as a clean room. And there is no clean room on a dirt. <laughs> as a dirt surgeon, a dirt archeology span soil site. Um, but it does lower the, the issue of contamination. Now, lastly, we're a public archeology span site. 
and you can see the opacity of the plastic and you know we're not trying to hide what we do from the public but our burial permit and our ethics and our workflow requires the quiet and respectful excavation of these individuals who lived and died at the beginning of our nation and are not known about honestly and so that's why we sort of use opaque plastic we want the public to see what we're doing. We want them to be informed. We always have a staff member or one of our volunteers interpreting outside. But it's critical to us to be able to quietly, respectfully do what we need to do, and but also engage with the public. Now, as a research program, we committed to excavating three or four of these every season. And the reason for that is that from the onset, when we excavated one of these many, many years ago, it was clear that the preservation was very poor and that if we waited too much longer, you were gonna lose data or information about these individuals. Now, part of honoring those of the past is to create a biological profile of each individual, right? So we're all artifacts and I think people often forget that. Um, we the things we do to our bodies, broken legs, fillings, uh, you know, things like that, our surgeries, um, are often reflected in our skeletal structure, our bones. And so um, that's no different for these individuals. Their, their bones tell a story, and that story is about the nascent or the inception of the English population in English North America. And uh, it's a very important so the work that Dr. Raquel Fleskes is doing with this population currently is to look at can we recover ancient DNA from these individuals? And if that DNA is viable, are any of these individuals related to each other? And so we're building a strong basis for future research with ancient DNA. Looking at bone chemistry is something else we do. Um, when your mom said you are what you eat, you are. And we can look at diet, stress, and disease with these individuals. Uh, status also comes from that. But these are all important ways that we honor those of the past and learn their story before they disappear in, um, in, into the ground. Now within these three, you can clearly see that they're at different levels. And that reflects, you know, there's some forensics about that, about expediency and stress and things like that. But I did want to talk a little bit about what we're seeing with the, the uh, layers of soil. So this was our youngest individual, a young indi a person about maybe between 11 and 14 years of age. Um, currently, that's our understanding. Uh, but if you look here at the back, this is an excellent profile down to the base of the grave. Uh, we've got a plow zone or a a horizon that has a leached zone that's you know about 30 35 centimeters of leached soil so as the rainwater or meteoric water matriculates or it trickles down through the soil it accumulates as clay um, you can see that as the deeper you go in the e horizon and into the b the darker and more dense the clay gets. Now that's problematic, right? And um, for us and these remains, because as that water trickles down, the meteoric water, the rainwater, it fills this nearly impermeable clay or slowly perking clay with water. And so the individual, it's almost like it's in a bathtub. That water sits in there, slowly dries out. Now that's and it has an adverse effect on human remains bone because it, the wet dry wet dry cycle breaks down the bone structure and leaves us with uh, honestly very poor uh, remains. Now the the decay process is natural here in Virginia. Sometimes there can be materials within the grave fill like oyster shells or copper that help preserve that. But also, um, in this case, there was about eight feet of a Confederate fort on top of these individuals that when we excavated during the course of our 
our project, we inadvertently caused that process to accelerate. In other words, they were closer to the meteoric water and less shielded by, by that Confederate earthwork. So a number of years ago, we made the commitment to, to excavate these, like I said, three or four a year um, as part of our, our research project. So the graves aren't the only features out here, and you can see that um, this, this discoloration here, uh, which actually, interestingly, uh, represents the A, E, and B horizon when they dug this feature, which is a post hole uh, for a building, I think. Um, this post hole was dug through those layers and then backfilled. The post set in it and then it eventually rotted away. Um, but this post cut that grave and that's something to point out that throughout this entire burial excavation area there were a multitude of features through time and those have to be excavated before you dig into the burial. You're trying to remove contamination or later time periods to isolate that one burial so that you can actually make sure you're telling time. And these graves really didn't have a whole lot of artifacts because they were some of the first features or excavations to go in here at James Fort in 16.7. So that's what we ended up finding. But you certainly don't want Pepsi glass in your 16.7 burial. Now, what I wanted to show you guys, and one of the questions that we get asked a lot is, why is this down to here? And that is one of our most exciting tools that we're developing as dirt surgeons, and that's ground penetrating radar. If you have a keen eye, you can see that each of these is on different levels, and each is about the same level from, for example, where I'm standing, or this over here, that to the bottom of the grave. And that's not a mistake. Uh, one of the tools that we've developed, as I said, is ground penetrating radar, and that's high frequency. So the lower the frequency of a radar, so 350 megahertz, for example, uh, the deeper you can go, but the less resolution you get. The higher the frequency, for in this case, we did 2700 megahertz, the more detailed it is. So, for example, with 350, we might not see an object any smaller than my fist or a softball or tennis ball. Whereas with high frequency, 2700 megahertz, you can see individual bones um, within a grave. Working with uh, Geophysical Survey Systems Incorporated, GSSI, and uh, one of our colleagues, Peter Leach, um, we develop those tools and we continue to push that sort of research forward. Now there's a benefit certainly for us and why we do it. It's because we can image the individual before we even dig into it. We want to know the orientation of our individual. We want to know are the remains preserved and are they going to take more time. Now in terms of imaging and position, we always like to work from the feet towards the head. The feet are very complicated and the cranium is some of the most difficult and often not very well preserved. With this excavation, we went from theory to practice. With this grave here, particularly, I was able to image the cranium and bones and literally drew them on the ground before we even started to dig into the burial. And that is an exceptional tool for a dirt surgeon to have before he goes into the operating theater. Now each of these was imaged and each was actually from the radar. We knew that it was going to be in very good shape. All three preliminarily are males. These two individuals are adults and this person is a young boy between 11 and 14 years old. We know that from the forensics. Uh, all three of these are in the lab have undergone conservation and samples have been sent to the University of Connecticut at the Dr. Deborah Bolnick lab where Dr. Raquel Fleskes is researching and sampling them for ancient DNA. Now, eventually we will wrap this excavation up. We will put down geotextile fabric to preserve the site, fill this back in, 
So stay tuned. Uh, we'll continue to, to uh, push information out about what we found and take you on our journeys around the world as we uh, rediscover the archaeology of James Fort. Thank you.